The following program is brought to you by friends and partners of End Time Headlines. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the broadcast. I am Ricky Scaparro, the founder and the voice of End Time Headlines, and we welcome you to this special Prophetic Viewpoint segment. Today, I'm going to be dealing with a very interesting subject, and it's called, Are We Seeing the Blueprints for a, the Formation of a One World Religion? So we want to welcome you to the podcast, to the broadcast, if you're watching on whatever platform you may be listening or watching from. Again, if you are able to comment in the the, uh, section of whichever platform you're watching from or listening from, let us know if this is your first time joining us and where you guys are joining us from. So where did we come up with this title today? We came up with this from a headline that we reported on our main website at End Time Headlines dot org headlines.com and this was the headline massive facility overseen by pope francis to pave the way for a one world religion in 2022 so maybe you, many of you guys will probably who keep up with our ministry you'll remember that headline let me give you a little bit more information about this quote are we about to see the formation of what will ultimately facilitate and pave the way for a one world religion according to a a recent report the abrahamic family house this is what it's being called is a facility that will enclose a synagogue a church and a mosque now i want to read that again because i want to emphasize something here when we move on again this uh this single complex which is scheduled to be inaugurated in 2022, is now 20% complete. Um, And the committee, which is also supervising the project, said it's inspired by the 2019 document on human fraternity constructed in the United Arab Emirates. The project is closely followed by Pope Francis and the Grand Imam Ahmed El Taib of Al Azhar, who endorsed the design. Now, what is this? Again, this is a single facility that will facilitate, and again, it's called the Abrahamic Family House, that will enclose or facilitate a synagogue, a church, and a mosque. Now, why is that interesting? Because all these Uh, A synagogue, a church, and a mosque all represent the three major monotheistic religions. Now, I know that's a big word, uh, but basically the the definition of monotheistic is the three religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam uh, that worship one God while denying the existence of other gods. So if you want to know what the word monotheistic is, and again, we're talking about Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, and this facility that is being overseen by Pope Francis that is going to be constructed in the United Arab Emirates is going to facilitate all three houses of worship under the same umbrella together this is extremely interesting the abrahamic family house derives its name from the old testament biblical figure abraham who is recognized and greatly revered sorry excuse me guys greatly revered by jews christians and muslims the abrahamic family house's design by architect sir david uh, Ajay, Ajay, I believe that's how you pronounce it, captures the value shared by Judaism, Christianity, and Islam through three main buildings, including a mosque, a church, and a synagogue in one place. Quote, as such, the complex uh, recounts the history and builds bridges between human civilizations and heavenly messages The names of the three separate iconic houses of worship in the, quote, Abrahamic family house complex are officially unveiled as Imam Al-Tahib Mosque, St. Francis Church, and Moses bin uh, Mamon 
Mimon, I believe that's how you pronounce it, synagogue. Moses ben Mimon was a prolific and influential Jewish philosopher of the Middle Ages. Now, when I read this, guys, this to me, again, uh, is a picture of what we saw at one time. If you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 11, we see here that in Genesis 11, it says that the whole earth was one language and one speech. And according to researchers, historians, and those who have, um, uh, who have spent a lot of research on this, there's books even written about this, and they claim that every major false religion was birthed out of the plains of Shinar, where the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11, was constructed. Again, they were one language, one speech, and one religion, all together with one mind and one purpose. And then God himself stepped in, and he brought division because they came together with the wrong intent. This is extremely interesting. Now, I want to go a little bit further. Because again, I find it very interesting that Pope Francis is one of the individuals that is uh, directly involved to oversee this project. Now, there was a lot of controversy that has surrounded this Pope. And we're going to talk about that right now. Uh, there was an article uh, that came out from CNS News. Uh, the Catholic News Agency cited this uh, and, and some other outlets. And uh, allegedly a 95-year-old self-professed atheist and journalist who was a longtime friend of Pope Francis came out and claimed that the Pope does not believe Jesus Christ was incarnate and divine. Uh, in fact, he went on to say that the pontiff told him personally, and again, this is, a, uh, this is not something I'm telling you, this is something that I'm quoting, this is something that I'm citing, and I'm just relaying to you information that's out there, you can research it for yourself. According to this man, the pontiff told him that once Jesus Christ became incarnate, he was a man and he was a man of exceptional virtues, but not at all God. Now, again, this was an alleged conversation between this professed atheist and the and Pope Francis himself. Now, I cannot verify to you, I cannot confirm to you that this is absolute truth or that this really happened. I'm only giving you the information. Um, we know, according to the Daily Wire and other sources, we know that Pope Francis was also directly involved in changing the way the Lord's Prayer was cited. Uh, that came out not too long ago. Uh, on, in fact, it was on May 22nd uh, of last year. Um, he also was involved with, on April 15th of last year, Pope Francis embraced a young boy whose father died as he visited St. Paul of the Cross Parish in Rome, uh, on Rome of April 15th. And uh, he told the child that his atheist, his father, who was an atheist, there was people that heard him say this, that his father could be in heaven even though he didn't even believe in God. So again, why am I telling you this? Because again, there is a lot of controversy centered around this Pope. And I'm going to, when we get to Revelation chapter 13, and we get there, the, all this will make sense. In his first major speech in Morocco, Pope Francis emphasized the importance, listen to this, of religion in building bridges between people. Again, this is all going to all this is going to do is confirm to you why the Pope would even be involved in spearheading or supporting or coming along the side of a project in which you would pull Judaism, Islam, and Christianity together under the same umbrella. 
According, again, article cited here and reports in a one of his first major speeches in Morocco, th this Pope emphasized the importance of religion building bridges between people and encountering fanaticism and extremism. He also made a strong appeal for a positive response of solidarity to the global migration crisis. Um, Pope Francis was even greeted at Rabat, Rabat International Airport by King Mohammed VI, a, descendant, a direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad and a royal guard of honor. From there, the Pope and the King drove in parallel motorcades among cheering crowds and, and rain in the Hassan Tor uh, Esplanade in Rabat, the capital of this North African Islamic kingdom of 35 million people, where he addressed the people of Morocco watching on television as well, the civil authorities and members of the diplomatic corps. So again, there was this picture of Islam and Catholicism coming together. Now, there is a lot of prophetic chatter regarding the what we, what we know as the final pope. Now, where, where are we getting this? There is a 900-year-old, what they deem to be a doomsday prophecy, uh, and many believe that Pope Francis could actually fulfill the final piece of this 900-year-old doomsday prophecy, uh, according to many close Vatican leaders. Now, what, what are we talking about here? According to the reports, uh, in the 12th century, there was an archbishop by the name of St. Malachi who alleged, this was in 1139, that Malachi left Ireland for Rome to give an account of his affairs and where he reportedly received, again, this is all alleged, where he alleged received a strange vision about the future, including the names of 112 future popes. Now, interestingly enough, in the names of these 112 popes, see, there's a whole list. You can go research. You can Google it. You can find this. In this list, he talks about Pope Benedict XVI, who was the Gloria Olive or the glory of the olive, the order of St. Benedict, also known as the Olivetans, which is which many claim makers Malachi, uh, which, excuse me, let me say this really slow again, which many claim that Malachi's prophecies uh, which validates him to be correct. But his prediction for the 112th and final Pope was more concerning because it read, quote, in the final persecution of the Holy Roman Church, there will reign Peter the Roman who will feed his flock amid many tribulations and after which the seven-hilled city will be destroyed and the dreadful judge will judge the people. Now, uh, Historians generally conclude that the alleged prophecy, now many historians believe that it was a fabrication written shortly before publication and attributed to Malachi, but others, even in the Catholic Church, uh, esteem the prophecies of Malachi to be uh, legit, and they hold it to great esteem. In fact, now this takes me to where I want to go. When we go to Revelation 13, the Bible says in Revelation 13, 11, John the Revelator says, I saw another beast. Now, he said in Revelation 13, 1, he sees the beast rising up out of the sea. This is the Antichrist. And then in Revelation 11, he sees another beast coming up out of the earth. One is out of the sea. One is out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. According to the description of this second beast, it says, uh, now to, to, to spare you time, you can read this in Revelation 13. I want to give you a little bit of homework that you can do. Revelation 13, read from 11 down to verse 17, and here's what you'll discover. 
The first beast rises from the sea. The second beast rises from the earth, implying here that the second beast will rise among the earth or among civilization or among men or those in the earth. This is the only place in the entire New Testament that the, the symbolism here of a lamb is not the symbol of the traditional symbol of Jesus Christ, but is clearly an indication that whoever this individual is, will he will be depicted as, or he will be displayed as a false Christ, okay? Because this lamb has two horns, but he speaks as a dragon. He has two horns. He looks as, as, as a, of, of a lamb, but he speaks like a dragon. Now, here's what we know. Let me give you 10 facts about this false prophet of Revelation 13. Number one, he's the second beast. Number two, he has two horns like a lamb. Number three, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Number three, he speaks like a dragon. Number four, he causes the earth to worship the first beast, which is the Antichrist. Number five, he performs great signs and wonders. Uh, that's given to him by Satan. Number six, he makes fire come down from heaven in the sight of men. Again, his power comes from Satan. Number seven, he deceives those who dwell on the earth by these signs that were granted to him. Number eight, he commands an image to be made to the first beast against the Antichrist. Number nine, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. Again, this is a demonic power. And number 10, it is the false prophet who issues the mark of the beast system dedicated to the Antichrist. So there's your 10 things about the false prophet that you need to know about. Now, the Bible indicates that this lamb, which we've now we've covered here that this is not Jesus Christ, but this is a false Christ. Now remember Jesus warned about in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. He said there would be false Christ, false messiahs that would rise, false uh, prophets, and this, they will be deceived and they will deceive many. He talks about that in all three of the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Here we see this false Christ that will arise. And in the Bible, these horns represent authority. Now, where are we coming up with this? Proper hermeneutics, which basically is a theological term for corrective, correct interpretation of scriptures. It's called the law of first mention. Just like, again, when you talk about a lamb, the law of first mention is Christ. But we know here that this is not Jesus Christ because of all the other characteristics of this second beast that don't line up with Jesus Christ because we know Jesus comes back in Revelation on a white horse, come on, as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he will actually battle the Antichrist and the false prophet, ultimately casting them into the lake of fire. So this second beast here is not Jesus Christ, but it's a false Christ. Okay. So horns represent authority. Many scholars and theologians agree that the two horns here either represent this man, whomever he will, uh, whomever he is, he will exercise authority over a political head and a religious head. So again, he will have authority granted to him because horns in the Bible, if you go to the book of Daniel, you'll see when, when the Antichrist begins to take power over these 10 kingdoms, you see there is 10, the Bible talks about there's, there's 10 kingdoms and up among them comes the little horn. Again, horn representing kingdom, representing authority, representing power. So this false Christ, this false prophet will have dominion over or power over two kingdoms or a political system and a religious system. Again, some things, guys, we see in part, we know in part, we see through a glass darkly, okay? But we do know this. According to Revelation 13, we see in Revelation 13 clearly that the Antichrist and the false prophet will 
have a religion, whatever that religion is, they will both be in power over it. They will both command people to, uh, to submit to it. In fact, when you study Revelation 13, the mark of the beast, he talks about the name of the beast, the number of the beast, or the mark of the, the name, the number, or the mark of the beast. And it's in, it's in conjunction with the Antichrist. So whatever the religion is of the Antichrist, whatever that religion is, it's going to be portrayed through the image of the beast, through the system of the beast. And I believe the mark, the name, or the number is going to somehow coincide with whatever the faith is or the religion is of the Antichrist and the false prophet. Because your Bible says the false prophet here in Revelation 13 will command the people of the earth to create this image. And they will have to worship this image. And guys, it doesn't take a genius or rocket science to figure out that they will worship this image under the guise of whatever religion it is. And I'm here to tell you, based on all the scriptures, that whatever this religion is, it's going to merge. It's I, 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 I can say this with a lot of confidence that Whatever this false religion is, this one world religion that's coming in the end days, in the end times, in the time of the end, the end of the age, whatever you want to call this, whatever this one world religion is, it is going to have to, watch this, it's going to have to merge the three major monotheistic religions together. Now, why do I say that? Because there is... I would venture to say hundreds of thousands of religions. I mean, come on, guys. We've got, you've got Jehovah Witnesses. You've got, you've got the Church of Latter-day Saints. You've got the Amish that has certain religions or certain uh, belief system and religions and sects. And S that's S-E-T-S. You've got, uh, you've got Buddhism, Confuci Confucian, Confuci uh Confucius, sorry, you've got new age mysticism, you've got all humanism, you got all these, you've got religions in and in, in, in everything imaginable. But again, who are the top three in all of this? Again, it's the three major monotheistic religions, meaning they all worship one God and they despise every other God, quote unquote God, and that is Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. So it is my personal opinion that in the time of the end, whoever this false prophet is, now, is it Pope Francis? I can't 100% tell you yes, but whoever this false prophet is that will arise in the time of the end. He will have one agenda, and that is leading the masses to worship the Antichrist. Again, the mark of the beast system and the image of the beast are both created to give glory to the Antichrist, who, by the way, will be empowered by Satan, demonic forces. Remember, guys, when the Antichrist enters the temple in the first part of the tribulation, he will actually enter into Jerusalem, enter into the temple. Temple. He will set up his stronghold. He will set up his seat. He will set up his place authority, and he will be worshipped as God himself. This is where the whole, uh, the abomination of desolation comes into play, which is the image of the beast that will be erected on the pinnacle of the temple. And those that have knowledge of this, the Bible says they will be so horrified, they will flee from the city because when they see this, it'll be so blasphemous. But this is where I want to close with this. Whoever this false prophet is, is going to have to create somehow, some way, he's going to have to merge 
these three major religions together. Now, how in the world are you going to do that? Somehow, in order to do this, whatever the faith, the doctrine, and the belief is of this major end time false one world religion, which will be the religion of the Antichrist. Listen, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell I can tell you right away one common denominator that's going to be across the board, and it will be the spirit of Antichrist. Did you hear me? I said it'll be the spirit of Antichrist that will be directly intertwined, inter, interwoven into this faith, into the faith of this one world religion. Now you say, what do you mean the spirit of Antichrist? The Apostle John used the term Antichrist four times, and it means against Christ or one who opposes Christ. A Christ. Let me give you these scriptures, and then I'm going to give you the characteristics of this spirit. Ready? 1 John 2.18. Little children is the last time, and as is, and is yet you have heard the that antichrist shall come even now there are many antichrists plural tense whereby we know that it is the last time first john 2 22 who is a liar but he that denies that jesus is the messiah the christ the anointed one he is antichrist that denies the father and the son that's very important number three first john 4 3 and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And that is the spirit of Antichrist, where have you have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. Number four, 2 John 7, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Now, when you put 1 John 2, 18, 1 John 2, 22, 1 John 4, 3, and 2 John 7, when you put these together, you get the big picture, and that is that whoever the antichrist is in the time of the end and the false prophet, they will have one religion and this religion will have this common denominator. Ready? It will be empowered by the spirit of Antichrist and be controlled by the Antichrist. Ready? Number one, it will deny the deity of Jesus Christ. Number two, it will deny that Jesus is the son of God. And number three, it will deny the relationship between the father and the son. Now, listen. In order for that to happen, you're, you're looking at a counterfeit Christianity or an apostate Christianity, and you're going to see an apostate uh, Jude a form of Judaism, which, by the way, I don't have time to get into this, guys, but most Jews are not, uh, are not messianic. They don't believe in Jesus Christ. So this is not going to be very difficult to do this for this man to do this. Whoever this Antichrist is, whoever this false prophet is, when they work together, this will not be difficult because most of the people in Israel are not messianic. Most of the Jews or Orthodox Jews, they don't believe. Listen, a lot of them are mystics. They don't believe in Jesus Christ as, as like you and I, as the Messiah, as Lord, as Savior, as there is no other name under heaven given unto men in which we must be saved but the name of Jesus. Jesus Christ. So therefore, again, let me say this one more time. These three characteristics are going to be found in whatever this one world religion is. It's going to be identified as, it's going to be known as, and it's going to be characteristic, characteristic, characterized as, characterized uh, as a religion that will deny the deity of Christ, deny that Jesus is the Son of God, and deny the very relationship of the Father and the Son. Now, why is this interesting? Again, if, if, I say this, if Malachi's prophecies are true, that makes this very interesting. Number two, if the professed atheist that had a private conversation with Pope Francis and if his conversation is true of what he said that the Pope believed personally about Jesus, the son of God, then guys, this 
absolutely is stunning, number one. Number two, it could pave the way for this. And again, I'm going to go back to the report. What's being, what's being constructed? What's going to come to fruition in 2022? A worship center with the purpose of merging the three major monotheistic religions together under one umbrella, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, and it is being supported, full support by Pope Francis himself. So guys, again, please don't forget to share this. Don't forget to subscribe. If you've not subscribed yet, you can do that um, by going to our main website, um, intimeheadlines.org, intimeheadlines.com. Don't forget to download our app. If you've not done that, you can do download our free app. It's available on Android. It's available on uh, Apple. You can download that, get it into your hands, uh, subscribe to push notifications, push yes to that. You're going to get these podcasts right in your hands. You're going to get all of our news and headlines, our breaking news alerts. You're going to get all that right there in your hands. And as always, guys, we want to give you the opportunity, if you've not yet become a monthly partner of our ministry, uh, to help us uh, to remain strong and active, you can do that. Uh, and just pray about becoming a monthly partner. And you can do that two different ways. You can give electronically through the app or through the main website, or you can give, uh, you can give uh, by check or money order, uh, which I call the old school method. And you can make that out to End Time Headlines, P.O. Box 1391, and that's Monroe, Georgia, 30655. So again, guys, uh, we appreciate you again. Don't forget, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on whatever platform, of whether it's Rumble or YouTube. Uh, don't forget to share this uh, and link this to, to you know to whatever platform you're on social media and get the word out. I believe this is a a, a very um, right now uh, informative word that we need to know and the body of Christ needs to know about. So God bless you guys. Uh, until we see you tomorrow, uh, may the Lord bless you, may he keep you, and may his countenance be upon you. We'll see you soon. Thank you for listening to the End Time Headlines podcast. We pray that you've been blessed and equipped by today's message. For more information about how you can help partner with our ministry, please visit endtimeheadlines.org.